We are facing a national crisis. And if we do not ascend to the levels in which we were threatened at the Great Depression, when we were threatened in World War II, if we tell the American public that we are more willing to invest and bail out big banks than we are willing to invest in our farmers and our urban families, then I don't know what we're here doing. Calling climate change an existential threat to humanity, congressional Democrats introduced a policy proposal in February called the Green New Deal which would mandate that 100% of U.S. energy production come from clean, renewable, and zero-emission energy sources like wind and solar by the year 2050. But some environmentalists say Green New Dealers are neglecting one obvious source of abundant clean energy already available, nuclear power. It's when the conservationists became environmentalists that everything went bad. Why is that? Well, because it stopped being about the environment, ironically. It stopped you know, became about controlling society. Michael Schellenberger is a lifelong environmentalist and founder and president of Environmental Progress, a pro-nuclear research and advocacy nonprofit based in Berkeley, California. He believes that increasing our reliance on nuclear power is the only way to combat climate change and has become one of the leading pro-nuclear voices in the media. In the effort to try to save the climate, are we destroying the environment? Well, I think nuclear is the best for inherent physical reasons. With nuclear, it means that a single can of Coke provides enough uranium to provide all the energy that you need for your entire life. And then after you're done, after that's after you're done splitting the atoms and releasing heat, that becomes the waste. Schellenberger started his career in energy advocating for more government subsidies for wind and solar. He pushed for a new Apollo project, modeled on the original Apollo moon mission, and sought $300 billion in federal research and development funding to make renewable energy sources cheaper than coal within a decade. We'll fund the Apollo projects of our time. At the California Institute of Technology, they're developing a way to turn sunlight and water into fuel for our cars. From 2009 to 2015, the Obama administration took up that call and put billions of dollars into renewable energy subsidies, which Schellenberger says opened his eyes to the reality that no amount of government funding can solve the inherent drawbacks of renewables. During that time, we started to see the various problems that a lot of people are familiar with already with solar and wind. They require huge amounts of land and thus trigger very significant local opposition as well as opposition from conservationists who are worried about the impacts on threatened and endangered species. And then the other one is just the unreliability of solar and wind. It means that when the sun is not shining, the wind's not blowing, you always have to have some backup. California invested heavily in renewables, which he says led to energy price increases at a rate about six times faster than the national average, despite the falling cost of solar panels. The point of renewables was always to create scarcity and high costs in electricity. That was the benefit. That was viewed as the feature, not the bug, of renewables and, and decentralized low energy living in the 60s. It's only recently that it's been dressed up as a kind of form of abundant energy. But everywhere we see that the consequences of doing renewables at significant scales is the same, which is to make electricity expensive. If you want to save the natural environment, you just use nuclear. You grow more food on less land and people live in cities. It's not rocket science. The idea that people need to stay poor, that's just a reactionary social philosophy that they then dress up as a kind of environmentalism. Schellenberger calls his pro-growth urbanist vision of environmentalism eco-modernism. Congress member Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her allies, on the other hand, he associates with so-called dark green environmentalism. It's a very romantic view, you know, Ewok society, basically, um, re returning to kind of uh, small farmer agriculture, mm -hmm. tends to be very negative, very apocalyptic, very utopian, very dogmatic. How much of that do you, attitude do you think persists today? Oh, 100%. I mean, I think it's shot through the core motivations of all of the leadership of the environmental movement. Now, what they do, though, because that's a minority view, I think it's an unpopular view among most people, what they then do is they go dress up their anti-nuclear stuff and all sorts of nonsense. They go and tap into people's unconscious fears of the bomb. That's really the main event. 
The anti-nuclear energy movement was informed by the Cold War, reaching a fever pitch around 1979 when the China Syndrome was released, which explored the possibility of a nuclear plant meltdown leaking radiation deep into the earth and poisoning the groundwater. Ignition. Still dropping. Twelve days after its theatrical release, the U.S. experienced its first nuclear plant meltdown at Pennsylvania's Three Mile Island. At about four o'clock this morning, two water pumps that help cool reactor number two shut down. Officials say some 50 to 60,000 gallons of radioactive water escaped into the reactor building and that the radioactivity penetrated the plant's walls. There were no casualties and it had no detectable impact on the health of workers or nearby residents but it marked the beginning of the end for nuclear energy development in America. No new nuclear plants have been built in the U.S. since, and 19 have been closed. China syndrome completely framed our perceptions. Then the No Nukes Festival, which was an anti-nuclear energy rock concert, but in it has a nuclear explosion and mushroom cloud in the background. So there was always an effort to kind of make people think of nuclear war, nuclear weapons associated with nuclear power plants. So it's basically been a huge concern troll for like 60 years. Um, you know, misinformation, propaganda, really attacking nuclear because it's a source of abundant energy. The connection isn't that the nuclear plants are going to suddenly blow up like bombs or create right. bombs, but that you can take the nuclear materials from the plants you already have them sitting right there and develop them into bombs. And right. we've seen that to varying degrees. For sure. What do you say to people who are worried about nuclear non-proliferation, think nuclear energy runs counter to that? I mean, the first thing you have to realize is that nuclear weapons spread, right? There used to be one country with nuclear weapons. Now there's nine. Nothing we can do about that. We try, but if a country really needs a nuclear weapon, like North Korea, if it is scared that it could be invaded, like the United States invaded Iraq, it's going to get a nuclear weapon. Have we had all these nuclear wars? Have they been used in wars? Have they made more wars? No. We see from 1945 to today, radical declines in deaths and wars and battles. So I think that the underlying fear of nuclear energy is nuclear weapons, and the underlying fear of nuclear weapons proved to be completely unfounded. These have been weapons of peace not weapons of war. This May, HBO was dramatizing the worst nuclear meltdown in history, Chernobyl in the Soviet Union in 1986. Some of them will not stop firing for 50,000 years. But Schellenberger says Chernobyl's implications are widely misunderstood. When I started to change my mind about nuclear, I just went and read the UN reports on Chernobyl. Yeah. That's the worst nuclear accident. I think it's fair to say it will be the worst nuclear accident that ever occurs. Why do I say that? Because there was no containment dome. It was literally just the reactor caught on fire, shot radiant material into the atmosphere, spread it all over the world. So it's inconceivable given the advances in the technology that we could have an accident like that again. So you look at the worst accident and according to the best available science, somewhere around 50 firefighters died immediately putting out the fire or a few years later and then about 150 people will die from thyroid cancer. There were several thousand increased cases of thyroid cancer. Yes. yes. So there were estimates that the number of thyroid cancers could reach something like 16,000. So the thing about thyroid cancer is that nobody should ever die from it. It's easy to treat. You just remove the thyroid gland and then you take a synthetic uh, thyroid substitute. Um, and so the people that will die from thyroid cancer are people that don't get the health care that they need. And so on the one hand, you kind of go, did they die from the thyroid cancer or did they die from lack of medical care? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sh shockingly benign technology when you really look at it. I mean, when you consider the fact that people die in coal mine accidents, 7 million die from air pollution. Fuel rods are now exposed and if they stay that way, they could release radioactivity and a disaster of unknown proportions. In 2011, three reactors and a nuclear plant in Fukushima, Japan melted down after an earthquake and tsunami hit the country. About 1,600 elderly Japanese nursing home residents died during a botched emergency evacuation, and a financial settlement was reached with the family of one potentially radiation-related cancer death, and contaminated cooling water made its way into the Pacific Ocean. With the Fukushima disaster, one of the worries is that this stuff is going to get into the ocean and have long-ranging effects that we 
don't even know about yet. Is there Fukushima radiation in the ocean? Absolutely. We can detect it. We can detect it off the west coast of California. The question is, are those levels of radiation very high? They're not. They're very low. The ocean's so huge. The earth just, you know, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? That's the first thing you learn in your eco-bio class in college. And so radiation just ends up diluting over huge amounts of areas. And that's why we know it doesn't have much impact. Radiation from nuclear plants basically never kills anybody. It just attracts a lot of our fears for kind of historical and cultural reasons. Fear of nuclear power not only caused Americans to stop opening new plants, but to decommission old ones. Rancho Seco, a nuclear plant constructed by the same firm that built Three Mile Island, was shut down by a local referendum in 1989 after experiencing a cooling malfunction a few months before the Chernobyl meltdown. Though its abandoned exhaust towers still loom over farmlands in the northern California town of Harold. Voters and citizens in Sacramento decided that the nuclear plant there was just too risky given its history. In the 1980s, Ed Smeloff was the sole member of the Sacramento Board of Utilities who favored closing Rancho Seco. Today, he's an advocate with the lobbying group Vote Solar. I met up with him at an old Ford manufacturing plant across the bay from San Francisco that's been partially converted into a solar power plant where Smeloff once worked. Did you sense any fear in the community of nuclear? Yeah, there was an element of the community that were worried about a nuclear accident, particularly because this was the same plant as Three Mile Island. It was a big demonstration there in 1979 after the meltdown at Three Mile Island. Mm -hmm. So I would say maybe a third of the voters there this is the regular alert for uh, Contra Costa County. It's not the kind of sound I want to hear when I'm talking about nuclear energy. Yeah. Rancho Seco closed 30 years ago. And only now is Sacramento's utility board close to reaching an agreement with another firm to store its nuclear waste, which currently sits under guard in a storage tower at a cost of about $5 million per year. As you have a source of contamination, radioactive spent fuel, that needs to be cared for for 100,000 years. And how we pass that on from generation to generation without damaging the environment or damaging, damaging future generations is not known. So nuclear waste is the best kind of waste that we produce from electricity production. Why do I say that? Well, the first reason is that there's so little of it. All of the waste from nuclear energy production in the United States can fit on a single football field stacked about 50 feet high. It's in canisters. We've looked really hard. We haven't found a single person that's ever died from it. If you were to fantasize, how would you want human waste to be? You would want it to be contained. You'd want it to be small, compact. You would want it to not pose any harm to anybody. Basically, that's what only nuclear has achieved. Nothing else really has achieved that. Smeloff says she favored shutting down Rancho Seco less because of safety concerns than the economics of plant operations. Rancho Seco experienced more than 100 unplanned shutdowns in its 15 years of operation. Beginning in the 1980s, with the passage of some federal legislation, it opened up a wholesale market. So it created market alternatives to nuclear power. What you're implying there is that there can be no real market in nuclear, that it necessitates a monopoly. Is that accurate? I think it's generally right. There's the risks associated with nuclear power require that the entities that own it have really deep pockets. And the way these plants operate, sometimes with extended outages, can have really significant impact on the financial returns. Nuclear energy does not fit in very well with a market approach. To the extent that other countries that were nuclear have transitioned away from nuclear towards renewables, the energy prices have gone up. And in California, we've seen our energy prices spike significantly since there's been investment in renewables. So from a consumer perspective, is an investment in renewables versus nuclear going to hit us hard in our pocketbooks? So I think the fact that Germany and to a certain extent California were early adopters, that is they took the initiative to say, we're going to promote wind and solar even though it's more expensive than the alternatives, has now paid, it off, paid off 15 years 
Hence, Germany shifted energy production from nuclear to renewables, and energy prices shot up to nearly double that of neighboring France, which stuck with nuclear. France continues to source 93% of its energy from low-carbon sources, the majority being nuclear, while now only 38% of Germany's energy sources are low-carbon. The German publication Der Spiegel recently published a cover story critical of the country's shift to renewables, featuring a drawing of a broken windmill. The unreliability is the main event. Solar and wind are producing a lot of electricity when you don't need it, and not enough electricity when you do. So on the issue of it producing too much electricity, you have to literally pay people to use it. It's called negative electricity pricing because the grid has to be perfectly balanced between supply and demand. So Germany's been paying its neighbors to use electricity, just like California's been paying Arizona to use electricity or paying big industrial consumers to use it. And then when you don't have electricity, then you have to pay a, basically a second time for some backup power. That problem is not going to be solved by having cheaper solar and wind. And you can even argue that cheaper solar and wind allowed them to make electricity so expensive because it created this illusion that they were super cheap. But as soon as you put them on the grid, you had the high cost of managing their unreliability. Very little land is needed to get rid of all fossil fuel electricity generation in the United States. That blue square there is the land area that's needed to transition the United States to a zero carbon electricity situation. It's really not much. Most of that area is going to be in rooftops. Solar advocates say that it's really all about the batteries and Elon Musk is going to create super batteries that right. allow solar to work. If you just take all of the batteries in California, including all the batteries in our cars, and you were to use them to back up electricity, you would still have less than 30 minutes of electricity backed up. Mm. But when you're talking about powering the entire economy on solar and wind, you would need to have backup battery power that would last weeks and probably months. So you're talking thousands of hours. It's just beyond the realm of possibility. The cost would be in the trillions. The vision that I think I'm seeing from solar people is a more decentralized approach where right. you have the battery walls on your home. Right. And then I guess there would be a grid, but much less strain being put on the grid. It's basically propaganda. I actually did focus groups in our office. And as soon as you introduced the idea that everybody would have batteries and solar and would be off the grid, people just fell in love with that idea. And like literally there's nothing we could say that would change their minds. Yeah. It's just something about it. it. I think it appeals to libertarians. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it appeals to it's very American. I, you know, I find people like on Twitter and social media who will say things like, well, we don't need nuclear because, you know, I have solar panels, you know, at my house and it's really cheap. And it's like, well, did you know that we were that all of your neighbors are subsidizing your solar panels and that, in fact, your solar panels depend on the grid? I mean, it's a fantasy. And I blame Elon Musk for actually promoting it. Yeah. Um, it's just clearly in his business interest to do so. But it's just incredibly expensive. Schellenberger concedes that nuclear for the time being requires subsidies, though he says that the unnecessary shutdowns of operational plants across the country have contributed to the high costs. But he is skeptical that the market alone can provide a clean energy future. If nuclear necessitates government-run program or a very monopolistic program, are you all at all worried about just that kind of concentration of power and control, especially over something like nuclear material. So to my, my friends that really are libertarian, they really love their freedom or whatever, is that, hey, you know, if you want to go off grid, go off grid. Like yeah. there's nobody preventing you from going off grid. But then don't go make demands on the rest of the society to subsidize your lifestyle choice, mm. right? That would contradict the whole idea. Mm. If you want to achieve these social and environmental benefits of clean, cheap electricity, then the society is going to have to make a choice to do that. I mean, there's no alternative to it. It's not going to be done in this kind of distributed way because it's not. that's just not how electricity works. It, it is the best kinds of electricity are centrally produced, but distributed broadly. If nuclear is not really attracting private investment and mm -hmm. other types of energy, such as natural gas, which does have fewer CO2 emissions than 
coal or other fossil fuels. Why not just let the market play itself out and move towards natural gas? I'm a huge fan of the fracking revolution that we've had. It's just opened up abundant natural gas. Natural gas is better than coal on like every metric. To build pipelines and move that gas across lands, you have to get the society's permission. You have to cross public lands. A lot of the gas and oil drilling is on public lands. What about the oil and gas revolution itself? It's always been supported by public investment. I mean, there's just a million ways in which the public is always involved in energy production. The neoliberal approach would probably be, you know, a carbon tax if we're worried about CO2 emissions and then kind of let it all play out from there. Do you think nuclear would thrive under that kind of system? I mean, for sure, nuclear would do better if there was a price on carbon. And so in that sense, I'm in, I'm, I'm in favor of it. I mean, the problem is, is that I've been doing this work now for 15, 20 years. And every time people propose that, it just ends up being really unpopular. I think once people understand that the technology is good, not bad, then we'll end up accommodating all these different things that you would need to do in order to move to it in the same way that we did when we figured out that natural gas was good or at least better than coal. Nuclear power provides about 8% of the world's energy, down from 17.5% at its peak in the 1990s. Though countries like India and China have begun to invest heavily in the technology and states like New York, Ohio, and Georgia continue to support nuclear investment with significant subsidies. While Energy Secretary Rick Perry has promised to make nuclear cool again, presumably through a combination of deregulation and federal subsidies. California continues to invest in renewable energy and plans to shut down its last nuclear reactor in Diablo Canyon by 2025. Meanwhile, thanks to the fracking boom, the Energy Department forecasts increased U.S. oil and gas production well into the coming decades. People are dying. This is serious. Iowa, Nebraska, broad swaths of the Midwest are drowning right now underwater. Farms, towns that will never be recovered and never come back. The real reason they hate nuclear is because it means we don't need renewables. 